hello good morning everybody uh, so we are having the first talk of today and this morning uh, by amos yarom will be telling us about new constraints on transport from schwinger keldish theory okay so uh, i'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation um, it's always a pleasure to uh, visit india and it's my first time here um, today I'm going to talk about some uh, new work I've been doing with uh, Kristen Jensen from San Francisco State University, Natasha Pinzani, who's now a postdoc at uh, Leuven, and Raja, who is a student at the Technion. Um, this work is based on uh, pioneering work by uh, Felix Loga and Mukund, and also by the MIT group, um, who um, developed a modern uh, formulation for an effective field theory for schwinger keldish theory. Um, which I'll discuss in detail. What I'm go going to show you is a sort of hybrid formulation, uh, in some sense, um, of, these, of these two groups. And uh, some of what I'm going to say has uh, overlap with uh, more recent results of these two groups that have been done with, with uh, various other collaborators, which I've listed here. Um, so uh, main player... In, uh, in this talk is, is the second law, or the main motivation for this talk is the second law of thermodynamics. You might have heard about this from uh, Ukund in his talk. Um, we all know that a process like, like this is, is allowed, and a process like this is not allowed, and the quantitative way to, to say which process is allowed and which is not is the second law. Second law is a, is a, is a global statement in the sense that it says that the total entropy uh, cannot decrease in, uh, in thermodynamic processes. Um, and I want to emphasize that it's global. The fact that it's global means that if, say, um, we have some process where entropy decreases in our universe and it increases sufficiently much in, in a different universe, then the total entropy is going to be positive and, and a process like this should be allowed by the second law. Of course, we all know that, that this can't happen. And uh, the way to make a more precise formulation about what is allowed and what is not um, has to do with a local version of the second law, which, uh, which one can find in uh, Landau and Lifshitz's textbook. So the local version of the second law says that if we have some region of space and uh, we want to talk about uh, change of entropy in that space, then the statement is that change of entropy plus the total flux that's leaving that region should be non-negative. Um, in differential form, what we say is that there should be a current whose divergence is non-negative everywhere. And uh, we also want to identify that current with, with, uh, with the entropy. So we say that in equilibrium, this current is going to be in equilibrium in the rest frame of the local rest frame of the system. Um, the current should be, uh, the zero component of the current should be the entropy density. And it turns out that with these two definitions alone, this, so this is the definition of, of the local version of the second law, a la Landau. And it turns out that one can get a lot of mileage just by um, this, this uh, definition. So, um, for example, one can constrain transport just by using this uh, law. The shear viscosity, bulk viscosity have to be positive um, in order for the entropy to be, uh, divergence of the entropy to be non-zero. Other terms have to vanish in order for the divergence of the entropy to be non-zero. So, so this is, this, this uh, sort of phenomenological rule uh, constrains uh, transport in, in a strong way. There's also an interesting interplay between uh, the second law and, and results from ADS-CFT. Um, Various results seem to be in conflict with the second law, and then we understood things better on, on the uh, hydrodynamic side, um, and, and there's, there's a nice interplay between the two. Um, so so we, we tend to believe that it's correct, but um, <clears throat> one, one can ask, is there a microscopic way to, to figure out, um, to, to get this law? From, from a field theory perspective, we know how to get a current that's conserved, but it's kind of difficult to get a current whose divergence is, is uh, non-negative. Um, and, and uh, well, this has been answered, I think, by, by Shayantani first 
Um, she showed that, that it should exist if, if the shear viscosity is positive, um, at least perturbatively in derivatives. And then uh, the MIT group derived it in, uh, from, from uh, schwinger keldish theory, and, and uh, our group, and also uh, Felix Loga and Mukund have, have a discussion on it. I think Mukund described it. And, and uh, so, so it, it does seem to exist, and I'll talk about that um, in this talk. Another question is whether this is sufficient to completely uh, determine transport. So, in, in high, so the first point in the implications says that we're talking, we're, it, it constrains transport. And the idea in hydrodynamics is, is the following. And we, we look at the stress tensor, say, in, in hydrodynamics, and we write down its dependence on velocity and temperature. Um, we write down the most general thing we can that's compatible with the symmetries of the problem, and then we impose the second law, and we see what kind of structure is left. Question is, so this is kind of a phenomenological way to, to study transport, and the question is whether this is uh, a, net, a sufficient condition to determine all of the transport coefficients. Are there other constraints other than the ones given by the entropy current, which can, which can um, say something about transport, what I want to show is that using schwinger keldish effective action, which I'm going to describe, um, there are actually uh, more constraints that are not captured by, by the second law. So um, most of the talk I'm going to uh, describe the schwinger keldish effective action. Um, it, it's, um, it's necessary in order to, to explain what we actually computed. And I'm going to show how to get the entropy current from it and, and then I'll have only a little bit of time to outline how, how new constraints are, are obtained. And like I said, our version of the effective action for, uh, effective action for the schwinger keldish uh, generating function is, is a hybrid version of, of what uh, um, MIT group and, and Felix Mukun and Loga did. So let me, let me just uh, remind you what, what exactly we're talking about when, when we say the schwinger keldish effective action. So you're all familiar with, with, uh, with this object here. This is a generating function of connected correlators. Um, if we want to compute some endpoint function in, in the vacuum, then we vary this thing n times with respect to sources. schwinger keldish effective action uh, does something similar for um, thermal expectation values. If we want thermal expectation values of some current, uh, of some uh, operator, then we vary the schwinger kelp generating function n times with respect to the source. Let me be a little more uh, precise here. So <clears throat> when we vary uh, the vacuum generating function, we actually get time-ordered uh, correlation functions. In schwinger keldish theory, it turns out that for every operator, we don't have one source, but two sources. So this is kind of a technical thing that one needs in order to deal with the fact that the initial state is, is a density matrix. So every operator has two sources associated it, with it, not one. And the statement is that if we do m variations with respect to source one and n variations with respect to source two, then we get this uh, thermal, and, and at the end of the, after the variation, we set the sources to be equal, then what we get is an anti-time-ordered uh, set of operators times a time-ordered set of operators in thermal equilibrium. So schwinger keldish theory does uh, is is uh, has again it has two operator two sources for each operator, and it gives not only time-ordered correlation functions in thermal equilibrium, but also this this particular combination. Often, instead of working with with one and two sources, one works with the sum and the difference of sources, and then one finds, for example, that this type of variation gives us uh, the symmetric uh, Green's function for the theory. Uh, in a similar way, one can get the retarded Green's function, uh, the advanced Green's function, um, so a variation with respect to two A sources is the symmetric one, A and R gives the retarded, R and A gives the advanced, and a variation with respect to two R-type sources, R is the average of the sources, gives zero, and, and this is actually kind of important in, in what follows, and I'll, I'll explain in detail why one gets zero here. <clears throat> okay, so um, 
We know that uh, we can write down the generating function in vacuum as, as a functional integral, and we can do the same thing for schwinger keldish theory. So the functional integral looks like this. Um, in the past, there is some boundary condition that uh, relates these two, uh, these two fields. Um, there's, there's a more formal way of writing down the schwinger keldish uh, generating function which looks like this. So u is, is, is the time evolution operator in the presence of a source A1, and u dagger is its inverse, or its, uh, its remission conjugate, um, in the presence of a source 2. So these two formulations are equivalent, and, and I'm going to use both in what follows. OK, now, if we want to study this generating function at, at low energies, then we often like to construct what's called a Wilsonian effective action. So the Wilsonian effective action is something that we insert in here, and it reproduces the low energy description, uh, the, a low energy version of this generating function. We can, what we want to do is to construct the same thing here. So we want to construct an effective action that will reproduce the low energy dis the dynamics um, of the schwinger keldish generating function. So, so this, is, this, is, this is our goal, to find this effective action. And the idea here is that if, we, if there's some, there should be some universality here, we know that uh, in many instances, we take whatever field theory we take, as long as it's not too strange, it'll give us uh, hydrodynamic behavior, um, well, as long as there are no massless modes um, that are dynamical, Goldstone modes, or, or I don't know, photons, um, we should get standard hydrodynamic behavior. Otherwise, we'll get superfluid or, or something like magnetohydrodynamics. In the simplest case, um, which is what I'm going to talk about here, we should just get hydrodynamic behavior. And hydrodynamic behavior is, in some sense, universal. So we expect to get some sort of universal effective action um, after we um, integrate out all the, all the massive modes. Now, um, we don't know how to actually do this. We can't actually do this in practice. So in order to find this effective action, what I'm going to do is what one does whenever one has uh, an effective act, whenever one has a theory and one wants to find the effective action uh, without actually integrating out, we just have to figure out what the, what the dynamical fields are and what the symmetries are and, and write down the most general action that's compatible with those symmetries um, and, and has these dynamical degrees of freedom, yes. OK, so let me, let me show you what, what the symmetries are. And, and here, I'm really, I don't want to talk about symmetries, some symmetries that are associated with the UV action, like some gauge, global symmetry or, or gauge symmetry. I want to talk about symmetries that are really associated with the structure of, uh, of the schwinger keldish uh, partition function. And that's because I'm looking for something universal. So the first symmetry uh, that I'm going to need to impose is, uh, is, is, is double uh, gauge invariance, flavor invariance. Um, we have two sources for each operator. And if there are no anomalies, then it means that the partition function should be invariant under separate transformations of each of these sources. The Keldish boundary condition does violate this, right? The Schwinger Keldish boundary condition. Well, in the, in, in the past, I want the sources to be equal because they're in thermal equilibrium. And in the future, I'm going to set the sources to be zero. So that you, you're allowing only initial states which are thermal equilibrium and are not general fluid dynamical states? In the, in the infinite past, it's in thermal equilibrium. And then I'm going to turn on the sources so that I can bring it out of equilibrium. And I can turn off the sources and see what happens when, uh, when so, I excite so it. In the future, you, you have to identify? or in the, in the far future, yes. I, I have to make them equal, at the very least. So then, then the, those boundary conditions you're, you're saying won't affect uh, this separate gauge invariance? Yes. OK. <clears throat> Um, the other symmetry I'm going to need is something called, that I, that, that, uh, I call schwinger keldish symmetry. The MIT group call this the normalization condition. Um, and it's a statement that if I set the sources to be equal, then because of uh, unitarity and cyclicity of the trace, the schwinger keldish partition function is just equal to 1 or, or some other number, depending on how we normalize things. 
Um, and the third symmetry is, uh, is a reality and positivity condition. So for vacuum... Just one question. Yeah. So, so, you know, like uh, in the kind of open theories, let's say Feynman were not considered. In the, in the, if you look at the answer, the Feynman were not write down uh, when you integrate out, say, harmonic oscillators. It doesn't have the symmetry. But what do you do in the past and future? I mean, there, there you, you do the initial state, which is thermal state, with the harmonic oscillator. And the final state is the schwinger kelly boundary condition. Just in the Feynman and non paper, if you just look at the influence functional. But the, OK, I'm not familiar with that paper. I, I can discuss it with you. But in the final state, what, what exactly do they, what, what do they impose in, at late times in terms of the path integral? But that means that the sources are equal or not? It depends what you, you have to say something, I mean, just when you draw this, it doesn't, what, what, what do they do with the sources explicitly? Equal, but do they vanish at the far future, or what do they do? Okay. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Right, so in, uh, for the vacuum generating function, the, the uh, generating function should be real. In the schwinger keldish theory, it's not necessarily real, but it should satisfy uh, this relation. Um, here, I, I, may, I allowed the uh, sources to be complex. We're going to need it later. Even if they're not complex, notice that uh, complex conjugation swaps the two sources. Um, so this is, this is the reality condition. There is also a simple way to show that uh, um, to show that, that this uh, generating function is, is bound. It's absolute value is bound. Um, it's, it's a few lines. I'm not going to show it um, in detail. And the last condition is something called the KMS symmetry. This is related to the KMS symmetry of, um, of, uh, that, that you all know regarding two-point functions. So what you're seeing here is, so eta A1 is uh, the CPT eigenvalue of the operator that's associated with the source A1, and the same thing for eta A2. And beta is the, uh, is the uh, inverse temperature. Um, so it appears here because essentially this, this operator generates translations in, in imaginary time. And the minus here has to do with the fact that we needed to use CPT in order to, um, to, get, to get this uh, equality. There was a way to formulate this in a covariant way, um, but I'm not going to do that here because it'll mean I have to introduce more notation, um, and I don't want to do that. So these are uh, the symmetries that we need. Um, the degrees of freedom, well, here we have to guess. We don't know what the degrees of freedom are. So, so it's going to be a guess. I'm going to motivate the guess for these degrees of freedom. So um, imagine that this is our fluid. Uh, the first motivation has to do with, with what the fluid variables are. So I think most of you are, are familiar or, or heard about the Euler, Euler's description of fluids, where at each point in space, we define a velocity field and a temperature, and then we look for the dynamics of, of the velocity field and temperature. A different, way, a different and equivalent way to describe fluids is, is called the Lagrange description of the fluids. And there, what one does is one keeps track of the world line of, uh, of a fluid element. So we have some mapping, and you can imagine that we want to keep track of, of, uh, of this fluid element. So we just, uh, we just describe its world line as a function of some internal time. And we have a continuum of these fluid elements, and that gives us this dependence on, on another coordinate sigma. So if we want to describe this, it would be some line here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, mapping as, as our dynamical uh, variable. Um, and I'm going to refer to, this, to, the, to the actual space where the fluid resides as the target space, and this sigma space as, as a world volume for obvious reasons. Second motivation for using these variables has to do with the fluid equations of motion themselves. So what we'd like to happen is that the equations of motion for hydro... So the equations of motion for hydrodynamics are conservation equations. It's this. We'd like uh, the equations of motion for the x variables to reproduce these equations. And, and this 
is what's going to happen in, in a sigma model. So if we define gij as the pullback of, uh, of the metric in the target space, then uh, the equations of motion are going to take this form. And uh, if we compute the energy momentum tensor, it takes this form. And you can check that conservation of the energy momentum tensor is equivalent to um, the equations of motion for the x field. So this variable, the equations of motion for this variable in this simple case, reproduce, uh, reproduce the hydrodynamic equations of motion. Same thing will apply for the current if we have a charge current. Um, OK, so these are the symmetries we have. This is, these are the degrees of freedom. Actually, we're going to have to double our degrees of freedom because we essentially have two, two, um, two sources for each operator. So in, if we want to talk about the energy momentum tensor, we're going to have two metrics here. Again, this is just some method of obtaining correlation functions. We vary with respect to the metric to get the energy momentum tensor. And then we set the two metrics to be equal, which is what happens in, in our real world. Yeah. This x alpha means how do you relate it to the velocity field? And oh, I didn't show it yet. So, so far, uh, well, x dot is going to be the velocity. Is in, in the Lagrange description of the fluid, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. x dot is going to be the velocity. It means the derivative is from the proper time. Is it? Yeah, I mean, you have to convert it, but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Roughly, it's x dot, and you square it, you get the temperature squared. I'll, I'll show it in a minute, but you know, I mean, in, in this version, how you get it. Um, so we have two, um, so, two uh, metrics, and that implies that we're going to have actually two types of, uh, of, um, of uh, mappings. So you can think of it as if we have two target spaces and one world volume, and uh, each one of these x's maps into, into a different uh, target space. Each one is associated with a different metric. <clears throat> OK, so, um, so these symmetries were uh, listed in, well, in, in this version or, or some, some modification of it by uh, by uh, the two groups I mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm going to show you, so now the question is how to implement them. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is, is our version of how to implement these symmetries. Our formulation looks like that, is, is similar in, in, in the way it, uh, it's structured to what uh, Felix, Loga, and Mukun did. Um, but the actual end result is, is, is identical to what uh, the MIT group have. Um, so let me show you the end result. The end result is, is this. The effective action is some integral over the sigma coordinates on the world volume to superspace coordinates um, of a Lagrangian and, and this L tilde. So let me explain why this is the structure. Um, so this, let me start with this L tilde. This L tilde has to do with the fact that the KMS symmetry is a Z2 symmetry. If I act with it twice, I get back what I started with. So in order to implement that, I need the effective action to have this Z2 symmetry. So what we do is, given some Lagrangian L, we just add to it its, its, uh, its uh, image under, under Z2. So if we have some uh, generator K, um, that, that uh, acts with the Z2 symmetry on the fields, and L tilde is the image of, of L under K. So this is a simple way to get a Z2 invariant uh, action. Um, the superspace coordinates come from, uh, come from this uh, schwinger keldish uh, uh, symmetry or normalization condition. Um, the, the idea is the following. So, um, remember that instead of 1 and 2, we used, to use, we used also R and A, sum and difference, or average and difference. So in this language, when, we, when the sources are aligned or the A fields vanish, um, the schwinger keldish effective action is equal to 1. Sorry, the schwinger keldish generating function is equal to 1. Um, and that means that if we vary it with respect to R-type sources, we're going to get 0. So in some sense, this is a, this is a topological uh, theory. 
if it, the Schwinger Keldis generating function should depend on R type sources when we set, uh, when we set the, on the sum of the sources when we set the difference of the sources to be zero, but it doesn't. It's, it's, it, 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 when we compute correlation functions, we get zero. So it, it's, it's topological in the sense that it doesn't depend on R type sources, even though naively it should. So there are two. Uh, this uh, difference variable uh, to zero, and uh, that turned out to be one, and uh, then you uh, took the functional derivative with uh, AR. But if uh, you started uh, with uh, this full functional itself, and uh, then at the end of it uh, set uh, this difference variable to uh, be zero, uh, would you get the same result? Yeah, because you're taking a derivative, keeping the R type. So you take an, an R-type derivative, and you keep the A-type terms fixed. Okay. So uh, it's, it's a partial derivative, keeping the other one fixed. So it, 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 it wouldn't matter. Thank you. Um, where was I? Right. So one, one can think of this as a, as a, as a topological uh, symmetry theory. Um, and it should emerge only once these uh, sources are aligned. So the theory in general is not topological. But when we align the sources, it should be topological. Another way to think about this, uh, to, to generate the symmetry, is just to think of the tree-level action, uh, the tree-level tree generating function, which is equal to the classical action. And what we can do is just make the classical action at least linear in, in the difference of the sources. Um, and that'll guarantee this thing at tree-level. And then we can start correcting for this by, by introducing some sort of DRST-like ghosts. So these two are exactly, at the end of the day, these two things are, are exactly equivalent. What we need to do is add some nilpotent operator Q, which is, which is going to be responsible for the symmetry. And an easy way to introduce a nilpotent operator is to use, uh, or to make the action uh, closed under this Q, is to introduce superspace. So what we do is we, collect, we add some ghosts, and we collect all the dynamical fields into multiplets. We say that Q acts like a superspace derivative, and, and we integrate over superspace. Now, I wrote here two superspace coordinates, not one. The reason the other one is there has to do with the KMS symmetry. So this Z2 operation and Q don't close into a group. In order for them to close into a group, we have to add the image of Q under K and, that's an, and it turns out that this is an extra uh, operator, which we denote by Q bar. So um, if before we had this, once we, once we add the image of Q under K, and I'm skipping here a lot of details, otherwise I won't get to the entropy current, um, what happens at the end of the day is that instead of two multiplets, we have just one long multiplet. Q acting on it is, is, is a derivative. Q bar acting on it gives us uh, an expression like this. This object here is a Lie, Lie derivative along, uh, along uh, the uh, temperature field. And because we're working in, uh, in a particular coordinate system, it just means this vector here. <clears throat> and the action itself is going to be some integral over these two coordinates. And, uh, It'll depend on, on these fields, their spatial derivatives, and also on, on any superspace derivatives that commute with both Q and Q bar. So these two operators commute with, with the action of Q and Q bar on the uh, X fields. So this is um, what we need to do in order to satisfy uh, this symmetry and also the Z2 symmetry. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is, um, this, is, uh, this is the structure. This is why the action is structured this way. Um, now, um, I need to give you a little more detail about how we deal with the other symmetries. So the Lagrangian itself, or, or well, I call L the Lagrangian, and L tilde, it's KMS conjugate, um, takes this form. So let me tell you what, what you're seeing here. So this G here. Is, is essentially um, a super space version of, of this pullback. So we start off um, with, with uh, this, this pullback that I described before. This ensures that we have 
different variants uh, in separately in the one and two uh, manifolds. Um, we used a super X because we wanted the Schwinger Kaldition KMS symmetry. And um, in order to have everything together, we have to collect these two into some super multiplet. Um, there's actually some fine print here, which, uh, which I won't go into in detail. There, there's actually a problem here, and the problem is to, um, to ensure both uh, um, different variants and, and the other symmetries, and, and the schwinger kelde symmetry, um, it turns out that there are some obstructions to do that. So what I'm writing here is really correct only in, in what's called a statistical mechanical limit where the sources are almost aligned. So we can only work perturbatively uh, in, in when the sources are almost aligned. So what this means is that the action is, I'm not going to show this, but, but one can think of the action as an expansion in difference type uh, fields. So we can get to as high an order as we want in difference type fields, but it's going to be perturbative in, in those fields. Okay, this, is, uh, this D is just uh, um, a derivative with a uh, connection, the Christoffel connection associated with this, uh, with, uh, with this supermetric. These we talked about, this we talked about. This I here comes together with a statement that the Lagrangian is a real function, and it's there in order to ensure that the reality condition is, is satisfied. Um, and on top of all this, we need to make sure that the imaginary part of the effective action is non-zero. Okay, so this comes from uh, this positivity, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this condition. Okay. <clears throat> so... Um, let me, let me give you an example. So this is our action. Let me just give you an example so you can see what's going on here. So this is, this is the simplest action I can write down, which doesn't have any derivatives. So P is some scalar function um, of this object, which is, which is, some, uh, which is diff different variant on the, on the world volume. Um, and now I can just compute. I can vary this with respect to the metric, uh, and if I look at its bottom component, I get, um, I get this expression here, where epsilon is the derivative of, of the pressure with respect to its argument, um, and I can identify the velocity field with uh, a, un a unit normalized velocity field with, with the direction of, of beta, and the temperature with its norm. Sorry, almost, you mean the entropy density is the derivative? Epsilon is not... Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, you're right. Sorry. It should be, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. It should be uh, P plus P equals T D P D T. Thank you. Yeah, I... I thank you. That's a mistake. Um, yeah, so, um, so this, is, this is a very simple example um, that gives us the ideal fluid once we uh, get rid of all, all the derivatives here. Um, a slightly more involved example is, is this one. So now I added, um, um, I added uh, superspace derivatives of this type. I like to have a theta and a theta bar uh, super derivative in order to have ghost number zero. So this is sort of the simplest thing I can write down that involves superspace derivatives. The minimum number is two. And again, if one works out the details, one finds this relation here, where sigma ij is the shear tensor, and eta is, is identified with the uh, shear viscosity. These two examples, I should say, um, were, were given in, in uh, Felix Logan Mukum's very early works. So, so far, everything agrees with, with what they have. Um, okay, so now let me talk about the entropy current. Before I go in detail in the entropy current, let me... Um, let me sort of just outline what I'm going to do. So what, what I want to do is to consider this, uh, the commutator, anti-commutator of, of these uh, nil potent symmetries, and I want to look at a current that's associated with this, uh, with this uh, Lie derivative. So I'm going to start with a toy model. Yeah. 
So all the constant that you had in partition function, that already you have imposed. Uh, so you got no constraint from there on eta or something, right? So at this stage, yeah. eta is free. Yes. So using entropy current, you are going to... Yeah, yeah, you'll see that it's positive. Yeah. But, but it doesn't follow from your set of constraint that you have. That, that is only no, going I didn't to... Impose, the only thing, I, what I didn't impose is, uh, is that, no, yeah, so I didn't impose yet that the imaginary part of the effective action is, uh, is uh, non-negative. And once you impose that, you get that the shear viscosity has to be positive. So I, I didn't impose it yet, but it can be imposed, and it has been imposed when people first looked at this, and, and it's, it's positive. Shear viscosity is positive by positivity of the imaginary part of the effective action. And what I'm going to show is that the entropy current is, should also be positive because of, uh, of the uh, positivity of the imaginary part of the effective action. Okay, so I want to start with a very, very simple toy model that, 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 uh, that seems unrelated, um, but it's easier to deal with. Let's just suppose we have some scalar field in a, in a curved uh, background. So um, the dynamical field is phi. If I do some general variation of fields and sources in this theory, I'm going to get um, I'm going to um, get an expression that looks like this. Um, and now I consider, can consider a transformation of this type, where beta is is some vector, um, which is not necessarily a symmetry. Um, and let me actually go to a gauged gauged version of this transformation. So lambda t is some arbitrary function of, um, of the uh, sigma coordinates. I, this, is, this is not a symmetry because um, the, um, the lead derivative was not a symmetry. Sorry, uh, the, the, the original action is not diffeomorphism invariant, this L that you're taking? In what, I mean, in what sense? In the sense in, that you mean so, that it's so, so, sprionic, so, uh, it's a sprionic symmetry if you add variation with respect to G. Yeah. I mean, in the standard sense. So I'm just trying to understand the statement that uh, the thing that you just had is not a symmetry. Why is it not a symmetry? Because uh, this L beta... It's not necessarily a symmetry, right? If I have an arbitrary action, I act with some lead derivative, it's not necessarily a symmetry. Symmetry so in the sense that the, this total variation is going... The variation of the action is going to be zero. Uh, so if, if you just have a clean Gordon field coupled to, let's say, metric... Uh, then the symmetry or don't is a symmetry of that. In what sense? I can't just translate in an arbitrary direction. It's a diffeomorphism invariant action, no? If I change this, the... Uh, what, do you, what, what do you mean when you say you, you want me to change the metric? Just, just, but you did change the metric. Yes. So if you change the metric also, it is a symmetry. Not if the metric is not invariant. And I think of this as a killing uh, symmetry. It's not a symmetry. Not every... Killing symmetry is not a symmetry of any action. You have to have the metric invariant under it. This is exactly... Why don't you wait just a tiny bit and... Okay, so... Um, so what I want to do is I want to make this thing uh, a symmetry. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is, is just by first introducing a connection. So I want to add a connection to my derivatives um, that has this transformation law. And this transformation law has been introduced so that the variation of the Lagrangian is going to be homogeneous. By that, I just mean that it's going to transform like the fields. So the fields transform in this way, and uh, by adding a connection, I can make the Lagrangian transform in, in, this, uh, in this way. So I call this a homogeneous transformation. Okay, and now what I want to do is modify the measure. So I want to note that if I look at, at, this, at uh, this, this delta t transformation of, of the measure, um, then it takes, turns out to take this form. And if I put everything together, um, one can show that uh, uh, um, this gauged transformation of the Lagrangian times a modified measure will be a total derivative. So that means that under, if I change the measure with this measure, then this transformation is going to be a symmetry. So in this action, you don't have a kinetic term no. for the A? No, no, no. A is an external field. Sorry. When I set it to zero, I get back my uh, original action. Yeah. You agree that you don't need the AMU, right? Sorry? If lambda t is 1, you don't need the AMU. 
just give me one more second. One more slide. <clears throat> okay, so what this means is that um, this, uh, the, this variation of the action is going to be zero. And uh, that means that we're going to get this on-shell relation. So we got that um, the, the uh, so remember that uh, the, the transformation for amu takes this form. Um, after we set a to zero, we essentially get something that looks like an abelian uh, field. And uh, on the, under the equations of motion, this vanishes. And what we get is that the divergence of this current s is going to be equal to uh, this expression here. And it looks like we got something for nothing, but all we got here is a conservation law once beta is a killing vector of, the, uh, of this uh, metric. So this S turns out just to be uh, energy momentum tensor contracted with, with beta. You got a question? Okay, um, so let's apply this uh, structure to, to this model here. Um, so in this toy model, we started with these transformations. Here, we're going to have just a transformation on the X field. And the, oh, sorry, this delta beta should be a, a lead derivative in the beta direction. Um, um, and we're also saying that the transformation of the target space metric is zero, and that's just because it's, it doesn't depend, the target space metric doesn't depend on the sigma coordinates, so its lead derivative is zero. So I can write here delta t of g mu nu, the target space metric is equal to the lead derivative of it, but that's just zero. So here, only the x coordinates change under this transformation. Now, what we need to do is add a connection. Here, we're going to have to add a connection to the, um, to the, to the regular derivatives, uh, which is going to be a super field, because the derivatives act on super, it's a super derivative. But we're also going to add, have to add connections to the super space uh, derivatives. Um, so we essentially, so, so this, this, uh, this external field that's associated with the symmetry is uh, actually a super field with super space indices in addition to bosonic indices. And now what we need to do is construct the current. And in this case, the conservation law was of this form. Here, we construct the current by, by the same principle. And the conservation law is, is going to take this form. So now this current, because it's coupled to a connection which has indices in the superspace directions, um, is going to be conserved in, in this sense. Can you explain what, what your inputs to this argument are? What are you assuming? Because I, I found, how, how did you get these transformations? How do I get which transformations? For the, in, in terms of these ATs, these MUs, how did you decide what those transformations are? How did you decide the transformation rules for the fields? You, you ask that the Lagrangian will transform homogeneously under, under delta. So it's answer analysis. Yeah, like any any time you have a you want to gauge a symmetry, you just write a connection which which makes your uh, derivatives invariant. Um, if you mean to say that, uh, I mean, you guys had a version of this in your earlier papers. But uh, we wanted the derivation. So, I mean, the motivation came from your paper, if this is what you were... Um, I'm not asking that question. I'm just asking, with what assumptions are you deriving the answer? Are you putting in the answer and, and just postulating a set of rules to derive the answer? Well, the question is, what's the question before I ask what's the answer? So the question is, I have this, I have this gauged uh, transformation, and I want to ask, what's the connection that'll allow the Lagrangian to transform homogeneously? That's the question. But that's the answer. But where did the gauge connection come from in your formalism? Uh, well, in general, once I gauge things, it's not a symmetry. So it's like I have you know, electrodynamics. I add a connection in order to make it a symmetry. But there was no symmetry to begin with in your formalism, was there? Yeah, that's right. So here, this is what I tried to explain in the toy model. 
it looks like what, what you're getting is essentially some sort of sprionic version of, of, uh, of a killing symmetry. So you're gauging a killing symmetry in some sense. My question is more that are you, are you putting in an answer and then getting it, or are you deriving it? An answer to what? I think probably Mukund, what is what what he's saying is that just that you know, like in the list of symmetries that you had in the beginning, the symmetry should have also been there. Oh, I disagree. So, so the symmetry, but it is it is you're imposing it in action, but you're not having it in the list of the symmetries. No, 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 no. I don't want to. This A is an external field. I, I don't want to add this as a symmetry. I want to set A to zero. I don't want to add it. All I'm saying is that the action I construct. I can now find some current which does, which is conserved in in this sense. It's not really conserved because I, I mean, uh, the target space is bosonic. Sorry. What do you mean by this symmetry? The symmetry you just described. Well, it's this because it, because Q and Q bar, the anti-commutation relations give me that. So it's not something extra I need to impose. I don't need to impose anything extra on top of the four things I listed. But Q and Q bar also did not, uh, you know, come in the list. So basically, no, I have no a, symmetry. Sorry, sorry. I have a list of symmetries, and then I asked how to impose them. And in order to impose them, I needed to introduce Q and Q bar. But I don't need to introduce anything else on top of that. Yeah, because Q and Q bar have this anti-commutation relation. Because there's, there's, this is the difference between cohomology and equivariant cohomology, which I think, yeah. I, don't, I didn't need to impose, so far I didn't need to impose anything beyond what I said earlier about Q and Q bar. So I don't want to, I don't want to keep the A's, I want to set them to zero. It's just an external thing that I add in order to get this conservation law. That's it. I don't want to keep them. They're not dynamical. Yes, all of A's to zero. Okay. All the A's are zero. So, so no components of it will be left at no. the end. Okay. No. So this is slightly different from what you guys did. All A's are zero. <clears throat> so um, once I set all the A's to zero, um, I get this, uh, this sort of version of, of a conservation law. The bottom component of this equation looks like this. And I can rewrite it in this suggestive way. Now, remember that entropy current had two defining properties. In equilibrium, it had to be equal to the uh, entropy density. And in general, it had to be non-negative. And it turns out that this current um, I'm going to show you is, is equal to um, is at leading order in derivatives, it'll always take this form. And the imaginary part of the effective action being positive ensures that the right-hand side of this conservation equation is uh, non-negative. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just start with this, uh, with this zero derivative action, and you just compute this explicitly by carrying out the variation, and you get this expression here. And uh, in order to do this, you have to work harder you write down the most general Lagrangian that you can that's compatible with the symmetries. Here, I've written it uh, as an expansion in superspace derivatives. So I always need two. And integrating by parts, you can show that this is the most general thing that one can write down up to ghost terms, which I'm setting to zero because I want things to be on shell. So I just use this. And then we compute the imaginary part explicitly. We compute this explicitly. And one can show that, perturbatively in derivatives, this leads to this. <clears throat> OK, so, so uh, this is how we have positivity. And you can see it's sort of a weird mechanism that ensures positivity of the entropy current. We had this superspace current with superspace indices, which was conserved. But the non-bosonic part um, is really responsible for, um, which should be a minus sign here, is responsible for uh, entropy production. OK, so let me, um, in the five minutes I have, let me, let me show you um, how, how we get things that can go beyond the entropy current. So remember that if we had this simple 
uh, Lagrangian, it leads to, to uh, uh, a fluid with, with this structure for the energy momentum tensor. One can now show that the shear viscosity has to be positive because um, the divergence of the entropy is positive. So this eta here, um, we, we say that it's dissipative because it contributes to entropy production. And uh, the pressure term, we say it's, it's uh, non-dissipative in some sense because um, it, it doesn't contribute to entropy production. It just contributes to the entropy density part of the entropy current. Um, it doesn't appear on the right-hand side of the entropy production equation. So, More generally, what we can do is just write down this horrible-looking uh, Lagrangian and classify terms according to how they can contribute to entropy production. <clears throat> So um, let me start with this term here. This term here, which has no superspace derivatives, we call it a scalar term based on the um, earlier analysis of, of Felix, Loga, and Mukund. Um, it turns out that these terms here always uh, never contribute to entropy production, and they also don't enter into the imaginary part of the uh, effective action. The other terms, we call them tensor terms. So this is going to be a two-tensor term, this is going to be a three-tensor term, and so on. The tensor terms can be subdivided according to how they contribute to uh, entropy production. So dissipative terms, um, if they're non-zero, will, <clears throat> will contribute to entropy production and also to the imaginary part of the effective action. There are non-dissipative terms which don't contribute to either, so they're sort of similar to scalars in some sense. And then there are, other term, there are two other terms, exceptional and, and pseudo-dissipative terms, which don't contribute to entropy, entropy production, but do appear in the imaginary part of the effective action. The difference between them has to do with CPT transformation properties of these objects, which I didn't go into at all. Um, so for our purposes, it's just one, one class. But if they appear here, then they're going to be constrained by positivity of the imaginary part of the effective action um, and not by entropy production. So if the only thing we know is, is entropy production, we, just, we, we won't know that, that these, these terms are constrained. Equations of motion, fluid equations of motion. Give, so let me give you an explicit example. Okay, so... Here's an explicit example. I'll say up front that this is kind of a weird example. Um, so this is my energy momentum tensor. It has this ideal term. I, ha I removed the shear viscosity. So this would be a fluid that has zero shear viscosity, which is kind of unusual. But this is the simplest example that we could come up with. And it has one transport parameter, which I called gamma. Here, this is the shear tensor squared times this tensor. And here I have the divergence of the velocity field times the uh, shear viscosity. If you just so if you forget about everything I talked about and you just say, okay, I have this stress tensor, what's the entropy current going to be? And you use the standard com computation that, that uh, well, essentially Landau and Lifshitz, it's been elaborated on by various groups, uh, then you'll find that the entropy current takes this form, but positivity of the imaginary part of the affection, effective action in this particular case forces gamma to be zero. So it multiplies some structure which can never be positive and therefore it has to be zero in this particular case. It's harder to find other cases because we're working in a derivative expansion. Um, the contribution to entropy production would you have a sigma cube term. Pardon? You don't have a sigma squared contribution to entropy production, but you have a sigma cube term. No, no. In this, in this particular example, if you have... You, you, you don't have, have eta, so you don't have a sigma squared contribution to entropy production, which is the usual lowest order product term. Yes. Instead, you have a sigma cube term, which, which whose sign you're not able to constrain. No. The entropy current is this. This is what you call non dissipative Entropy production is sigma cubed. Is that correct? The divergence of J is zero. This is something you guys called non dissipative I think. I'm not entirely sure. The divergence of J is zero. I hope I copied this right. But the right version is in our paper, so if there are typos here, I... Uh... Okay, so um, I'm, I'm essentially done. Let me just summarize uh, what, I, what I told you. Um, <clears throat> so I tried to explain how to write down an uh, effective action for the schwinger keldus generating function. Um, actually, now we have uh, not one in two fields, but also 
ghost fields, so you should really think of this as some weird mapping between, uh, can I have just, uh, a weird mapping between uh, a target space and uh, between a world volume and, and four target spaces. Two of them are for me are, are ghosts. Um, I talked about entropy production. Um, I showed how to construct the entropy current. So in some sense, we have some symmetry. I mean, a, a symmetry in in a, in a superspace sense where we have this current which is conserved. But if we interpret its bosonic and 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 uh, superspace indices separately, we get this. I should note that, uh, that the MIT group didn't work in superspace and still got this uh, relation. And, and I mean, one, one should be able to do that. These, this superspace is, is really just a bookkeeping device. If you're really careful about things, you, you can just uh, show this directly from the action. Um, and uh, I showed you how, um, what this classification, our classification, which is uh, in line with. Uh, with, with earlier classifications, except that we shifted around things so that it'll be more easier to read off for us to read off uh, um, the various classes. And, and we found these, these objects which, which, um, which uh, go outside of the standard phenological um, uh, structures that, that have been around for hydrodynamics. So, thank you. Uh, so Scientin's result was that if I uh, have up to four, if I impose eta greater than zero, then the rest of the terms, higher derivative terms, do not really uh, has any positive definite sign from uh, entropy production, right? Yeah, I add some more words, but yeah. Uh, so uh, so in your case, like uh, uh, so if if I do the same, suppose I set eta to zero, uh, will that imply that the uh, I mean, suppose I consider a configuration where I uh, turn, uh, turn off uh, shear viscosity term. But is it possible to uh, uh, still generate, like, uh, 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 there will be uh, other term which will be dissipative. Is it possible to have dissipative terms, say, any arbitrary higher order in derivative expansion, such that those coefficients will become positive? Uh, what I mean to say uh, that, uh, suppose I co consider a configuration. Which is uh, which will turn off shear viscosity term, say. Okay. Uh, will I still have dissipative coefficient yes. left? Yes. And uh, will that uh, so that that will not generate entropy, is it? Uh, no, they will. Uh, so so, but uh, del mu j mu s will have a definite sign or no? Yes. So uh, I'm not sure. So if I uh, okay, we check this. So there 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 is some subtlety here, but. We check this to uh, second order in derivatives, and there, if you just you know you you drop off the shear viscosity and bulk viscosity, you have second order in derivative terms. You can show that the entropy current is going to be positive because of uh, the imaginary part of the effective action, as long as certain coefficients are positive. Yeah. So uh, here you are dropping those by setting eta and z z zeta to zero. What do you mean by here in the example? Uh, in the example. Okay. Let's go to the example. So in the example, I, I, there, there, there are many, 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 many terms I, I dropped. I, I can add. I can actually add them. They won't affect this particular result. But and those other terms will modify the equation for both the entropy current and its divergence, and they'll be uh, constrained. This thing is just, it can't be, it has to, um, the structure is such that it can't be canceled by other stuff. Just one second. Uh, what I was trying to ask is that, uh, suppose instead you don't set all this coefficient to zero by hand. Yeah. Okay? Instead you choose a configuration. Such that uh, at first order you have no dissipative contribution. Okay. Uh, will at any higher order, uh, will I get any term which will be dissipative? In what sense? Uh, in the sense that it will pr uh, produce entropy. Yeah. Mam, you are independent field or it's constructed out of you? Sigma? Uh, sigma mu, you said the last term. 
Sigma, sorry, sigma mu nu is the shear tensor. So it's the, it's the uh, you take the derivative of the velocity field, you make a tensor out of it, yeah. then you make it symmetric and, and carry out a projection so that it's only in tangential to the velocity field. And so it's essentially, the, it's, I mean, roughly speaking, it's a symmetric uh, derivative of the velocity field. Oh. The reason I asked is that means uh, how did you show that this de derivative of j mu uh, will vanish because that has to be that with the total derivative of u should also vanish. Right? So on shell, you have to evaluate it on shell. This is on shell. Okay. So on, uh, entropy production is an on shell statement. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, well, at some stage you have mentioned that there is a conflict between two diff diffeomorphisms and uh, BRST. Yeah. Is it just a matter of looking for some additional corrections of the, or this is a just, uh, I mean, principle, matter of principle. Sometimes it's, I uh, wish do I you know, is, is there, how, how serious is this obstacle? We can, I, currently we, we don't know how, so let me, let me say this, um, the same problem will happen, so you can try to consider a simplified configuration where uh, you have only charge moving inside some thermal background, so your only dynamical fields would be those associated with charge, so it won't be X's, it'll be some other fields associated with a uh, global connection. Um, and then uh, you can say, okay, now I don't have diff invariance, you just have some other flavor symmetry. Um, so if, if uh, that symmetry is abelian, then you can uh, work it out and, and there's no problem. But if the symmetry is not abelian, you run into the same kind of problem. So that's what I know. And I don't know, you know, if this can't, I, I don't know. I, I wish I knew the answer to your question. I just want to mention that, the, I don't know if you are aware or not, there are no-go statements for, for having two gravities interacting. It's a kind of similar, it's very very difficult to combine two diffeomorphisms in a non-trivial way. Okay. So that uh, sounds a little bit reminiscent of what... Okay, uh, yeah, th thanks for the insight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Amos again. Thank you.